Welcome to the Kingdom. I'm Chris, and this is Good Enough Gaming. Okay, so we've got a table set up, we've got a fleet ready in Army Forge, now let's get to the game mechanics. If you've played One Page Rules Regiments, this won't be new for you, but if you haven't, pay attention here. Warfleets uses facings. Models can't see 360 degrees around them at all times like they can in Grimdark Future or Age of Fantasy. This means that movement, positioning, facing are a huge part of the game. Every ship has a front, side, and rear facings. If you're using square bases, this is pretty easy to determine just by drawing a line that passes through the corners of the base. If you're using round bases, it might be a good idea to mark your bases somehow to more easily determine the facings. It might not also be a bad idea to invest in one of those fancy laser pointers. You know, not the ones with that projects a dot, but the one that projects a line. Those are very helpful when trying to determine facings, firing arcs, and other elements of the game. Squadrons are the one exception. They don't have facings, and they act like the individual models that you're used to from Grimdark Future or Age of Fantasy. They can see 360 degrees around them, and they can move in any direction, instead of having to move straight forward according to their front facing. Now another significant difference in Warfleets is how the turns progress. In all other one-page rules games, you take turns activating units. Now Warfleets does have alternating activations, but you're not able to just activate any model at any time. To simulate the nature of fleet warfare, and to represent smaller ships moving faster than bigger ones, each round of the game is split into four phases that correspond with each ship type. And during each phase, only ships of that type are allowed to move in that phase. So first is the squadron phase. In this phase, players take turns activating their squadrons one at a time. You can activate any squadron model that hasn't already activated, but you can't touch any of your other ships. And if one player doesn't have any squadrons, because they didn't bring any, or because they've all been destroyed, the other player, or players, will get to move all of their squadrons, and alternating one after the other. Next is the light ship phase. Players get to take turns activating any light ships they have available, but nothing else. No squadrons, no medium, no heavy. Then the medium phase, then the heavy phase, each phase following the same restrictions. Once the last heavy ship has been activated in the heavy phase, the next game round begins, and we're back to the squadron phase. This is where a lot of the tactics and list building come in. You could build a fleet entirely of light ships, knowing you'll get to activate all of them early and maybe dominate the light phase. Or you could go with a mix of ships to make sure you get something in every single phase that gets to activate. It's another element of the game that doesn't exist in any of the other game systems, and it can take some getting used to. Now let's take a look at activations. Activations are mostly the same, but with a few twists, so let's go over those in a bit more detail. If you remember from the other OPR games, there were four basic activations. Hold, Advance, Rush, and Charge. Warfleets also has four activations. Hold, Move, Cruise, and Ram. They're very similar for the most part, but of course, a few subtle distinctions. So with the hold action, the ship stays where it is and can shoot any weapons that it has range, line of sight, and that the target is in their firing arc. That's why facings matter. You may have a total doomsday cannon, but if it's mounted on the front arc of your ship and the enemy pulls alongside you, you can't shoot it. But if you use the hold action, you're able to pivot up to 180 degrees. So you can face whatever direction you want, but this comes with a price. Ships that sit still become easy targets. So if you choose a hold action, it means for the rest of the turn, that ship will be hit by all other ships on a two plus. The next activation is move. With a move action, the selected ship moves the entire distance of its move speed. Must move that far, not can, must. That's another big change from what you might be used to in other one-page rules games. It's done to simulate the constant motion of a naval battle. A model in Grimdark Future could choose to move three or four inches of a six-inch total movement, but in Warfleets, once a ship moves, it must move the entire distance, and it must start moving forward in the direction that it's facing. 
Once it's moved half its move distance, it can pivot up to 90 degrees. Then it can fire at any target within its firing arc, range, line of sight. So you kind of need to plan ahead of it because you're going to have to move before you can shoot. And sometimes you might actually move out of range, out of line of sight, or out of your firing arc. So you got to plan ahead, almost like playing chess. Then once you finish moving, you can shoot. The next activation is cruise. If you choose a cruise action, your ship is going to give up shooting for some extra movement. Like the move action, you must move the entire cruise distance, and you have to start moving in the direction that you're facing. Now you can still pivot after moving half the distance, but you can only pivot up to 45 degrees. Big ships can't turn on a dime. The last activation you can use is ramming, and this one is just about identical to the cruise action. The only difference is that the movement must end in contact with an enemy ship, at which point damage is calculated due to the collision, but a bit more on that later. Now a couple other different features about moving, and then we'll move on to shooting. Because of the way moving works, it's entirely possible that a ship will sail off the tabletop. If that happens, the ship's activation immediately ends, and then in the next battle round that ship will return within 4 inches of where it left the table. Another situation that you might run into is that a moving ship might end its movement on top of another ship without intending to. They didn't choose the ram action, they chose some other action, but they accidentally moved on top of another vessel. If this happens, you keep moving the ship forward until it no longer overlaps, and then you can place it down. But each ship takes damage from the collision. Basically, you had an accidental crash, and both ships are going to take a point of damage. Squadrons are a little bit funky. They actually move like models in the other OPR games you've played. They don't have facings. They don't have to move their full distance. They can move and change direction as often as they like, and they can change more than 90 degrees, 45, 180. They can go wherever the heck they want. But they cannot take a ram action, so no kamikaze. Now, there might be some uh, specific fleets that have special rules, but the baseline is no kamikaze squadrons. Also, if a squadron decides to hold, it does not suffer the two plus hit status. And if a ship ever ends a movement overlapping squadrons, the squadrons just kind of move out of the way, the ship is placed down, and then the squadrons are put within one inch of the larger vessel. So squadrons can never ram, and they can never be rammed. Lastly, and this one's important for squadrons, this is how you use them to kind of uh, play escort with your big ships. Squadrons have a two inch engagement range that affects enemy squadrons. So if you start a squadron activation and there's an enemy squadron within two inches of you, you can't move, but neither can they. The two of you are basically now engaged in a dogfight and you gotta duke it out until one side comes up on top. So if your opponent is sending a fleet of bomber squadrons over to you, you can send out a, uh, a fleet of fighter squadrons to literally tie them down. Okay, so now that we've moved, it's time to put those naval guns to good use. You follow pretty much the same process as with Grimdark Future or Age of Fantasy. Declare your target for all weapons on the ship. You're not allowed to pick and choose and see how one does and then decide for the rest. Declare everything at once. Then measure to make sure your targets are in range, line of sight, and facing. Do recall though that your turret has a 360 degree firing arc, but everything else on the ship is going to be fixed to one of your four facings. Then. Grab a number of dice equal to the attack's characteristic of the weapon you'll be firing, but instead of rolling a quality like you do in other OPR games, your opponent will tell you what their target's evasion stat is, and that's what you need to roll to hit. Typically, smaller ships have a higher evasion since they're so much faster, and the big heavy ships have a low evasion because they're so big and ponderous. If the target, though, used a hold action, it doesn't matter what size they are or what the evasion skill is, they get hit on a 2 plus. Now once you roll your attacks, your opponent will now roll one dice for each hit, and they try to score their ship's toughness. Think of it like rolling to see if the shot bounces off the armor, or if it actually punches through the armor and damages the uh, ship inside. The toughness roll is modified by the strength of the weapon being fired, very similar to how armor piercing or AP modifies the defense role in Grimdark Future and Age of Fantasy. Also, like all other OPR games, a one always fails 
and a six always succeeds. Now, once you've gone through that process, for one weapon, you repeat it for every other weapon that has a valid target. If you assign multiple weapons to a single ship and then that ship is destroyed before you fired all the weapons, sorry, you don't get to fire the rest of them. You dedicated them, you blew up the target, but unfortunately the other shots are wasted. Now, if you're unfortunate enough to be on the receiving end of ranged attacks, for every toughness save you fail, you need to assign damage. And we talked about this a bit in the video going through the Army Forge. But in case you come to this video without having seen that one first, we'll go over it really quickly. Select one of your West weapon systems and mark off a damage box for each unsaved hit. Once an upgrade has taken any damage, you have to continue to assign damage to that upgrade until it's destroyed. If there's a remaining damage after the upgrade is destroyed, you gotta pick another upgrade and keep going until all the damage has been assigned. Once that last damage box on the last upgrade is checked, the ship is immediately destroyed and removed from the table. Now, 90% of the damage in war fleets is gonna be caused by some kind of shooting attack. The one time you have something like melee is if you choose the ram action. If you ram another ship, Move using the same guidelines you use for a cruise action until you come in contact. Then movement stops, regardless of how much leftover movement there is. The next step is to calculate the damage. Add up the number of max upgrades each ship has. Doesn't matter if they're destroyed or damaged, we're looking at the max here that the ship started with, because we're comparing basically the size of the two vessels. The ship that has fewer maximum upgrades suffers two damage. The ship with more upgrades suffers one. So there is a bit of a risk into ramming something. You're going to take damage yourself. If the two ships have the same number of upgrades, each one takes one damage and that's it. So normally you don't want to ram something unless you have a clear advantage in size and classification against it. You normally only ram if you have some kind of war gear or upgrade that allows you to repair damage or maybe really want to make sure you get that last wound off of an enemy's really, really important vessel and you don't want to risk shooting and missing or shooting and having them save, so you ram it and you've got some guaranteed damage. Now, after resolving the damage from the collision, if the target hasn't been destroyed, it might get pushed. It's just been rammed into by another ship and we're in the vacuum of space. If stuff collides, inertia kicks in. So if the target has the same or fewer upgrades, it will get pushed by D6 inches directly away from the ramming ship. If the push makes a collide with something like terrain or another ship, the ship that was being pushed stops moving and takes yet another point of damage. So it's possible, if you play your cards right, to cause three points of damage on an enemy vessel by ramming it and then pushing it into something else that it crashes into. Now the last feature of the game that works a little bit differently is morale. Ships don't suffer casualties that deplete the number of models in a unit, so you don't take morale tests each time you take damage. That's what we did in Grimdark Future and Age of Fantasy. Instead, we do something a little different here. Play out each round as normal. And at the end of the round, any fleet with half or less than its starting number of ships, just ships, not squadrons, they have to take a morale test for every ship in that fleet. So roll a d6 and add the number of functioning upgrades, not maximum upgrades. Damaged ones that haven't had all their boxes checked, they still count. But if an upgrade has had all of its boxes checked and it's destroyed, you don't get to count it. If the dice roll plus the number of working upgrades is equal to six or higher, the ship has passed the test and it stays in the game. But if the total is under six, the ship raises the white flag, surrenders, and is removed from the table. And if your last ship is removed from the game, all squadrons surrender as well and it is a clean sweep. And you'll have to do this at the end of every single battle round. So just because your massive battleship survived the morale test at the end of turn three, doesn't mean it's not gonna turn and fly away at the end of turn four. 
So that's it. Those are all the rules that make Warfleet different from the other one-page rules games. Everything else is special rules, and like we did with the previous videos, I'm not going to go through all of them. Instead, as you build your fleets, as you play around with the different combinations of ships and upgrades, you'll figure out what the special rules are, and you'll be able to decide which ones you like best, and build a fleet that really suits your taste, and that you have fun playing with. So go to, get some models, set up a table, and start battling in the cold vacuum of space. You'll see that it's pretty similar in a lot of ways to those other games, but you'll also see now why I didn't include this in my original How to Play series. And while it's not identical to the other games, and it does have a bit of a learning curve and getting used to, I think once you get the hang of it, you'll find that it's good enough.